What's up, guys? This is Mike Cashew, and you're listening to the Brute Strength Podcast. This week, I interviewed Julian Pinot of StrongFit. Julian works with a lot of top-level CrossFit athletes, including all uh, CrossFit Invictus athletes. He specializes in movement patterns, uh, fixing asymmetries and imbalances, and he's become hyper-aware of the most common ones that uh, CrossFitters and weightlifters have. So in this, in this episode, we talk about how to assess yourself, uh, how to fix those imbalances, as well as looking at principles before methods and, and kind of a totally different way of looking at coaching in general. This one's packed full of knowledge. Hope you enjoy the show. We are live. Awesome, man. How are you? Good. How about you? Very good. Thank you. I'm, I'm very excited. Why don't we start off um, by telling people a little bit about you um, and what, kind, what you specialize in? Okay, so uh, I started as an athlete very young. Like, uh, I, I think I started uh, at a very, uh, when I was, what, like nine, year, 10 years old, I think I started to play um, soccer at the national level and uh, been trying to do sports as, at the highest level possible for me anyway since, since then. So I've been uh, like a sports journeyman, if you want. I was state champion in different sports. And then, but my, my passion has always been coaching. I found uh, MMA when I was like 18 or 19. And right away, my coach got me to train, the, to, to train everybody on the, with exercises on the physical side of it. And so um, I guess my career always been as a coach. Like that's always what I wanted to do in life as, as being a coach. And uh, I specialize, I'm a strength coach, but I specialize as a movement uh, specialist in the sense of I uh, fix people. That's mostly what I, uh, what I try to do. And so right now I have uh, powerlifters, strongmen, and a lot of crossfitters. And so they, they come to me usually because they are hurt, about to get hurt, or stuck in their performance. And uh, so my specialty really is in this, is, is in make sure I fix imbalances so they can go out there and perform in their sport. And you work with CrossFit Invictus yeah. uh, and athletes like Lauren Fisher, Valerie Volbrill, some really, really uh, top-level athletes, right? Yeah, Maddie Myers, uh, the entire Invictus okay. team. Uh, I have a few Masters athletes also, right. Tina Angelotti and Trixie Aria. So I have a, I have a lot of high-level CrossFitters coming to me because the I mean the volume of the of the sport is creating uh, c- certain damage and everything, and so I try to keep them as balanced as possible so they can go out there and perform week in, week out. Right, right. So I, I find this interesting. You competed yourself at a very high level, and, and um, it sounds like a, a good bit of uh, individual sports. And yep. when I think of individual, uh, individual athletes, I usually think – I tend to think of them as more self-centered and, you know, not always a bad thing, but tend to be more self-centered and not focused on other people. But I heard you say in another podcast, I think it was the Barbell Shrug podcast, that um, you're a humanist, right? right? And you care more about helping others and fixing others. um, And and you, like you just said, you you always love being a coach more than an athlete. Where do you think that comes from? Uh, well, first of all, it impacted my career as an athlete because <laughs> uh, it's very, very hard to be a coach and a successful athlete at the same time. That, that's, mm-hmm. it's, it's very, very hard. It's not the same mindset at all. It feels like it's almost a different part of the brain that's working. So um, I've always been more attracted of, of being a, a coach. But that, honestly, that comes from who I am. I am. I've always been a humanist at heart. Since I'm a kid, like uh, philosophy, I've, I've actually uh, have a very classical education. I, uh, I read a lot about philosophy uh, growing up, things like that. And so that's, that's who I am as a person first, is I am a humanist. I always want to better humankind since a very, very early age. So I've always enjoyed being strong and, and training like that. But um, I competed because I wanted to be able to train harder. And competition allowed me give me a focus for my training. But for me, it was never about, uh, I hate losing more than I like winning. It, it wasn't so much about winning competition. It was just giving a focus to my training because I enjoy pushing myself tremendously hard. And um, thank God I've done mm-hmm. that because that allows me to have a good perspective when it comes to uh, the athletes that I, 
that I coach. Uh, I'm one of them, so it allows me to, to understand them better. But honestly, at heart, I'm a coach way before I am an athlete and always been. That's, that's just who I am, I guess. So does that, do you see that, or I'm sure you do, what, what other ways uh, does that manifest in your life, this, this uh, humanistic nature of yours? Um, I try to understand, uh, in order to help people, obviously, you have to understand, uh, understand people. So that has led me to, to move to different countries. So I moved uh, out of France when I was 14 and I went to live in Africa. Uh, that gave me the travel bug in a way. And so since then, I've been, I've been traveling a lot. I've, I went back to, to Europe where I lived in different countries, came to the States. From there, went to Brazil, came back here. Now, uh, I'm going to do some seminars back in Europe this, um, this summer. From there, I want to go to Australia. I want to meet as many people as I, as I can and, and learn about human nature as much as I can. So it's always pushed me in my reading. That's why a lot of the, the stuff that I talk about when it comes to training is not really training, necessarily training related. It's not about you know, periodization or things like that. It's more about um, life itself. I mean, because um, th- that's really what I, what I read about mostly is uh, s- things that touch humans, like uh, things about from philosophy to engineering to things like that. I try to learn as much as I can about humans. And so I'm a, I'm a huge nerd when it comes oh, to stuff it. like that, but not necessarily p- pure training. That, that's why a lot of this, I always say that I want to tell people uh, how to do things, not what to do. I'm not interested in doing periodization. That's why online programming. I don't want to tell people what to do. I want to tell them how to do it. I want to tell them why to do it so they can figure things out for themselves. It's Nietzsche who said mm-hmm. that he did not like uh, humans. Uh, I mean, it works better in, in, uh, in French, but like um, I'm trying to better the, the human race, if you want. So telling one person what to do is give them a fish, right? I'm trying to teach everybody how to fish. Right. That's really my goal in life. So I try to expand my, uh, my horizon as much as I can to be able to communicate those kinds of things better. I absolutely love that. What is your, uh, what is your go-to book that you recommend or give, uh, philosophy book that you most recommend or give away? Uh, the one that, I don't know if I can give that one away, but uh, I will tell the one that touched me the most the most was uh, Thus Spoke Zarathustra from Nietzsche. I read it when I was about 18. And at the time when I read it, I felt he was talking to me directly. I don't know if you ever had an experience uh-huh. with a book, but where you feel like every page, the guy is talking to you. Like he wrote that book for you, mm-hmm. basically to talk to you directly. And when I, when I read that book, that's how it felt. Like every, every, every sentence, every page was... Um, I don't know, like, like an opening into my own head. Like, yes, I, understand, like, I, mm-hmm. I understood exactly what he meant and everything. So that, that, that book um, taught me, I mean, it touched me tremendously and taught me a lot. So that's really one of the turning points of my life is when I was 18, 19. Is, uh, that is Nietzsche, awesome. Yeah, Nietzsche was a huge influence of mine. And so, um, but it's... Well, what was the name of that again? Uh, Thus spoke Zarathustra. It's his, um, okay. it's, I Got think it. it's, it's the last book he wrote. He actually, it's crazy because um, he, was, okay. he was dying of syphilis at the time. And it's, he wrote that book in like four weeks. It mm-hmm. was, there's a crazy story behind that book also. And to me, it's, it's the, the, the book that touched me the most was that one. I love that. And I absolutely know what you're talking about with in, in regards to a book feeling like it's speaking directly to you. The the one that jumps out at me is uh, Man's Search for Meaning, Viktor Frankl. You know the book? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's- yeah. That, that I read that at, at really just the, the perfect moment. It was the yes. darkest kind of period of my life. And it just it put it it put my entire life in, a, in an entirely uh, different perspective. So. I definitely know what you're talking about. Yeah, books are, are, the, are humans' greatest invention. Like, to, there's so much power contained. It's such a small thing. It's insane how, uh, to me, it's the greatest invention. And unfortunately, I'm not smart enough to, uh, not, not good enough <laughs> to write something like that. But I figure maybe I can help. A, I can return the favor a little bit. You know, what books did for me, I want to do for, for mankind at least a little bit. Right. That's great, man. I love it. 
Um, I heard, I've heard you say that you try to teach principles yeah. over methods and you've already started to touch on that today. Uh, can you explain that and what are your, what, what are your, or some of your principles that you try to live by and coach by? Yes, it was, um, the, if you look, um, a, a lot of the great minds, the geniuses of this world, like if you look at Isaac Newton, if you look at Einstein and everything, their greatest capacity was to have very, very compli complicated ideas. Uh, they were able to put those very, very complicated ideas into very simple questions. Like, you know, Newton with the apple that fell from the tree. Um, Einstein with the guy in the elevator. Like, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but Einstein was explaining mm -hmm. gravity by uh, putting someone in an elevator and then the guy falls. Right. And so uh, if you look from the concept of being the, the, the elevator, there is no gravity there. So he created an entire idea that gravity and accelerations are the same, are the same thing. And that's how he created some of his of his greatest work was based on this. That's how the theory, you know, relativity mm -hmm. came about. It was from very, very simple ideas. Right. So th that's where the true power is, is correct. If you apply the correct principles, uh, you can go as far uh, you can go as far as you want. Like the, um, uh, it was Ralph Emerson who said there is a million methods out there, but very few principles. A man who uh, understands the principle can make up his own method, whereas a man who follows method without understanding principles will always run into trouble. So th that was right. a quote that always resonated when with me. When it gets tested, you can't. Yeah. Yeah. Go. Keep going. Yeah. No. So it was it was that idea, and then um, for for pure coaching. One time I read, um, it was a business lecture from, um, from Charles Munger. Charles Munger is Warren Buffett's right-hand man. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, I forget the, the name of the film every time. But, um, and he had the business lecture at USC. I think it was 1982, 1984. And he was explaining that in order to invest money, when they looked at a firm, he had uh, what he calls his point of uh, elementary uh, worldly wisdom. He had like 20, 20 points he looked at whether or not they were going to invest in a company. And all 20 points had nothing to do with finance. It, it was crazy. None of them were finance wow. related. They had to do with uh, right, life, right. life things like critical mass or uh, psychology mm -hmm. or math or physics or stuff like that. And so that was, from a coaching, coaching perspective, that, that was fascinating because I was like, to me, that's how it works. And I mean, like, it, um, if it works... Whatever works for life will work for training. So mm -hmm. I follow principles that are not necessarily training principles, but more like life principles. For example, like, like the idea of critical mass, you know, that like every component has to be within a certain percentage of each other to get a self-sustaining reaction. So that works really well for mm -hmm. training. You know what I mean? So, they were, so I started coaching like this with that idea of critical mass, which was very important because it was an idea of balancing everything. You know, like you can't have... Uh, for example, like with numbers, you can't have a super high squat. If your squat is 50 pounds higher than your deadlift, then you're not balanced. There's a problem somewhere. Chances are that problem is going to turn into an injury or at least a lack of performance. So it is a problem. Mm -hmm. So the idea was to have to be able to balance the athletes. And so um, to, to give a simple analogy, imagine there's an elevator shaft, right? And in that shaft, there's, there's a box. The box represents, so the shaft, the shaft represents performance. Right, the higher you go on performance, the uh, you go in the shaft, the higher your performance. So imagine there's a box inside that shaft, right? So the box represents you. You're sitting on top of the box. The higher I can make that box go, the better your performance. In order for the box to go higher, I need to put uh, fuel in it. The fuel is uh, stress. Is what they, what is called hormesis, which is a favorable response to stress. So the more mm -hmm. stress I can put into the box, the higher the performance goes. If I put too much stress for the box, the box goes down, here goes performance. So the key was to find a balance between the amount of stress I can put in the box and the size of the box. And the size of the box was something called, uh, that, I, that I refer to that is homeostasis, which is really balancing the athletes. So I have in the entire system based on the stress has to be re relative to the size of the box, which is really how balanced the athletes are. And so when I have those two together, 
that was the principle of critical mass. So when I look at an athlete, I'll always look at how balanced that athlete is. Mm -hmm. And so I base that after, like the size of the box is based on, on different principles. But the idea for me was always to balance the athletes because otherwise you start to have like small injuries, uh, you know, the soft tissue, things like that. So th the idea was balance, really. Right. And, and for those who don't understand, you're talking about balance, moving up, down, front, back, side to side. And rotating as well. Right? Exactly. So that box, so there's four corners in that box. So and one of the corners is the planes of movement. And so mm -hmm. like if you look at CrossFit, for example, everything is up and down. That's called a sagittal right. plane. And that's a problem because there is like there is no more, for example, pulling in the frontal plane. So frontal plane means um, toward and away from you. There's no movement right. in that plane of movement. The medium plane is left versus right. There's very little movement in the visual plane. And then transversal, which is everything that is turning or going side to side. There's absolutely none of it. So CrossFit has become a sport that is really dependent on one plane of movement. The problem with that is the body does not care that you do CrossFit or not. The body wants balance. I mean, it took us 300,000 years, more than that, to get to where we are now. And nature did it very slowly. And we, are, we have certain uh, movement patterns that are built in, in our genetics, material. And um, we take that and then we go into a sport that only uses one plane of movement something is going to give somewhere. It doesn't work like that. I mean, the body does not care that you do CrossFit. The body wants balance, always. What are some of the most common, common asymmetries and deficiencies that most athletes and CrossFitters and weightlifters in particular have? Um, okay, so the CrossFitters and the Olympic weightlifters are actually very close to each other in this. The main thing that I see is the... Uh, they all, they all have a shoulder problems. So there's two mm -hmm. levels to, to that. First of all, it's the left versus the right because everything in only lifting and CrossFit is... Uh, Bilateral. Yeah. And so that creates always uh, uh, an imbalance between the strong side and the weak side. And that's, mm -hmm. that's a big problem. And then after that, it's the, the, the lats are not, are not strong enough. The reason is, is uh, even the pull-ups in CrossFit now are butterfly or kipped. So the range of motion of the lats is not, is not correct. Like under tension, uh, I've always noticed that the range of motion of the lats is short. Like if you put your arm overhead, um, the, the lat cannot stay engaged while the arm is perfectly overhead. So that means whenever you want to control weight overhead, if your lats cannot do it, you'll have to default to your chest. And that puts a lot of stress on the shoulder. So the lack of, of, of lack, uh, sorry, lat strength, because nothing is done in the, in the frontal plane, and the lack of uni, uh, bilater enfin, unilateral movement in those two sports creates a huge uh, problem on the shoulders. And on top of that, because you're not in the frontal plane, so again, away and toward each other, there's no, the chest activation in CrossFit, for example, is very minimal. So mm -hmm. if you don't have lat strength and you don't have chest activation, uh, those are two things that are supposed to anchor the AC joint. Um, people have to realize that the shoulder is a floating joint. There's nothing keeping it together except tendons. So if you don't have the chest and you don't have the lats holding your shoulder together, you're putting a lot of stress on the labrum and things like that. And so I see so much shoulder problems in CrossFit and Olympic weightlifting. It's crazy. And, and on top it's, of that... It's more... Yeah, I think it's more common for... I mean, it's less common for people not to have shoulder problems yeah. than it is to have oh, nowadays. Completely. I, I get... That's mostly the emails I get. I get so many... My mm -hmm. shoulder hurts when I do pull-ups or stuff like that. The problem is the keeping is at the, at the top of the, of the range of motion, you're floating. So the lats never truly have to engage. So now CrossFit is teaching your lats to, to work very little because by the time you're catching the tension again on a butterfly, you, you can uh, use somewhat your chest, you can use different muscles. Mm -hmm. So the, the lat activation is not there. And that's creating right. a humongous issues on shoulders. So I, I want to keep going with these with these most common imbalances. Mm -hmm. but first, what what are the low hanging fruit in terms of exercises that people can add to their training to to not fix but just help prevent the, these asymmetries and even correct these asymmetries and specifically this one in the upper back that we're talking about. Yeah. Last. Okay. So a very simple exercise is the barbell rows. I mean, done correctly, this is a uh, this is a humongous help for um, for the lats, this used to be part of every program since I can remember. 
And unfortunately, in CrossFit and actually only lifting, they don't do any of it. So the barbell row is a very, very important exercise. They, they used to call it the squat of the upper body. It's a very mm -hmm. simple exercise, but I would recommend everybody jumps on that. And so then barbell that, row, we're, swi we're switching grips every time, or are we always yes. going pronated? Yeah, yeah what, no, no, we, we're switching grips every time, because that's one of the other okay. issues, uh, one of the corner of the box, enfin, sorry, part of the plans of movement was also the fact that everything in uh, CrossFit and Olympic weightlifting is pronated, you know, thumbs facing each other. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing is work with the thumbs facing up neutral, or thumbs facing away, which is uh, supinated. So we need to work uh, also the different uh, hand positions. So I do barbell rows uh, pronation, but also supination. And I do dumbbell rows. Uh, that way your grip is in neutral. And it also works the left versus the right. So barbell rows and dumbbell rows, to me, are just should be in every program out there. No question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, how about supine pull-ups? Is that a yes, good one? Yes, exactly. Weighted or unweighted. Yeah, that, that's a great idea also. Making sure that you engage uh, your lats uh, throughout the entire range of motion. That's very important also. That's something we, we can talk about after. But the, the problem also is understanding that uh, you have to have range of motion under tension. A lot of people are doing passive stretching now with CrossFit, but right. the key is to have range of motion under tension, which is not the same thing mm -hmm. as passive stretching. And so supine pull-ups is a great idea because it will engage the lats. Make sure your elbows stay facing uh, in front of you and don't go to the side though. Right. Because otherwise you're just chilling the position is not supine pull-ups anymore. Even mm -hmm. though your, your, your hands are facing you, because your elbows turn out, you're doing something else. Right. Are you familiar with uh, functional range conditioning? I don't think so. It's, uh, it, it's exactly what you're talking about. It's kinetic, kinetic something or another, where, where you're um, taking, challenging your range of motion through movement, um, th under tension, basically. So I love it. That's yeah, what I, yeah, that's real, what I do, because I created a, a set of uh, what I call the openers, which is a set of exercises exactly to do that. Mm -hmm. So I'll check it out for sure. Love it. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, send you a text after this. Yep. Um, okay, let, let's do one more. Let's do one more of the most common uh, you know, imbalances that CrossFitters and weightlifters have. Okay, so what I see more and more now is the uh, inability of CrossFitters and some Olympic weightlifters to hinge. Mm -hmm. I know it sounds weird and then uh, you would think most most crossfitters well, they're not actually hinging they're starting the movement with their quads which is more like they're starting the movement by squatting and after that they go toward flexion and ex extension of the spine but it's hyper extension huh yeah, yeah they've learned to cheat and to not hinge anymore to go into so most of the movement are either squatting or flexion or extension of the spine there's no more hinging and that is a major major issue and this is why you see the you know, like the, the shark fins in CrossFit, like mm -hmm. the, the super developed lower back. Uh, that's why you see people with, with major back pain or stuff like that. It's because the hammies and the glutes are not working properly because you are not hinging. You are either squatting and extending the spine, which is not the same thing at all. So that's a major, major problem on that one because hinging is a, should be a basic skill. Right. This is as important or more than, the, than learning how to squat. Oh, yeah. I, I, to me... No question. Squatting, right. it's easy. Hinging is the key because without hinging, you have no hammies, no glutes. That means mm -hmm. you have no stabilization of the feet and everything. So you're putting more pressure on the Achilles tendon. You're putting more pressure on the knees. You're putting more pressure on the back. There is no question that most of the lower body injuries you see in CrossFit is relating to the fact that people do not hinge correctly. They use their spine way too... On, on top of it, as you can imagine, uh, flexion extension uh, of the spine under heavy load is not a good idea. Mm -hmm. Like imagine what it does to the vertebrae over time. You know what I mean, and then right, you're right. gonna it just, start. It, it increases that load yes. by a lot, right? Yeah, and you're gonna again. CrossFit is very new, but you'll see like you know, 10, 20 years down the road, you'll start to see like serious problem, uh, serious spine issues from right. uh, just using the erectors so much. You are not sub the erectors is not a. It's not a flexing muscle in a way. You know what I mean, it's just uh, the erectors are there to stabilize. Mm -hmm. Not to lift in a way. Know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah, we're starting to see a lot of disc issues. Yeah, of, of course. Couple years. Yes, and that's yeah. that comes straight from not hinging correctly. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I mean, uh, I see most people. It takes me, um, you know, like three, four months to get them to hinge correctly. And then, of course, their hammies are on fire when they do that. 
And mm -hmm. uh, but that's it's taking me way too much work to make people hinge. I'm I'm very surprised at this. Right. And this is where is this coming from? Overdevelopment of the quads, underdevelopment and use of the hamstrings. What else? Yeah, well, it's, you know, back to the sagittal plane and in CrossFit, they want to do everything very fast. So if you look at right. CrossFit, uh, because of the choice of exercises, favorite, uh, CrossFit favors the, uh, the pressers over the pullers, right? If you want to mm -hmm. be good at CrossFit, you're going to have good quads, you're going to have good triceps. So it favors the pressers. And the pressers naturally, like usually people are either pressers or pullers, not like, you know, 100%, but they mm -hmm. usually favor one versus the other. You see that a lot with martial arts between the strikers and the grapplers. And so a lot of people, uh, if you want to be good at CrossFit, you better be a presser. And so from there, uh, CrossFit has, the evolution of CrossFit has led to movement that are more toward pressing. Everything is up and down in a sagittal plane, mm -hmm. so that's mostly pressing movement. So uh, the ev evolution of CrossFit toward the competition and everything is pushing everybody toward the same kind of movement, which is mostly pressing. So uh, hinging is not required anymore in a weird way. For, you know, and in, in order to go fast, it's a lot faster to load your quads than it is to load your hammies, that's for sure. So mm -hmm. on a kettlebell swing, if you hinge correctly, it will slow you down compared to uh, a movement where you would just use the quads and then extend mm -hmm. the, the spine forcefully. That, that's going to be a faster movement. And so the combination of everything in a sagittal plane and that idea of we have to go as fast as humanly possible is creating uh, an entire type of athletes that are just really, really good at squatting. Yeah. And so that we, we uh, go back to a side program to CrossFit that is necessary to compensate for all this. Like, I uh, remember you cannot, if you look at martial arts, you can't learn Jiu Jitsu just by doing sparring, right? Once in a while, you're going to have to work on technique. It's a little bit the same thing for, for CrossFit. There are certain basic skills and certain level of strength that are required. So we, we need a side program to CrossFit to compensate for whatever CrossFit the sport is not doing. CrossFit mm -hmm. used to be a training system. Now, it, now it's mostly a sport. So every sport has built-in deficiencies. We need to compensate for those. Otherwise, you're going to start to see a lot of trauma on the athletes. Right. And I'm, I'm at the forefront. I see the same thing all the time. Shoulder, mm -hmm. no hinge. Shoulder, no hinge. Again and again and again. So I know it's, I know it's how hard it is to explain this kind of thing uh, using audio only. It, what, are, what are a few or even a, just a couple exercises people can add to their to their toolbox as well as resources that they can use to go and find out more about um, you know fixing these issues. Okay, so well, for the hinge field, they're gonna have to learn to understand what a hinge is, and most people mm -hmm. don't. So imagine if you, um, you're doing a stiff leg deadlift, right? So your knees are gonna be soft, but you're not gonna, once you start the hinging movement, your knees cannot move anymore. If you control the knees, you control the hammies. Now imagine if you put a pencil next to your hip. As you lean forward, the pencil should turn because again, you're hinging at the hip, you're not hinging at the spine. A hinge means it's your hip that is turning. So if you had a pen stuck to your hip, as you, as you lean forward, the, the pen should keep turning. If it stops turning, guess what? You're using your spine. So mm -hmm. before we go into exercises, because it's not really what they have to do, it's how they have to do it, people have to learn the skill of hinging. And they all think they can do it, and I've seen very people that do it correctly. So I've noticed that people can hinge, let's say, the, uh, about that spot where their fingertips will touch their knees. Anything past that, it'll be flexion of the spine. Right. So learn to hinge until your uh, fingertips can touch the bar. Because if you can't do that when you deadlift, that means you're going to have extension of the spine. So first thing first, learn to hinge until uh, you're in the deadlift position. So do a stiff leg deadlift with the empty bar and learn to hinge correctly. And again, uh, uh, with a good range of motion because your, knees by, uh, your fingertip by your knees is not enough. Everything in CrossFit is off the floor. And so you're going to have too much spine involvement if your hinge is that short. So lengthen your hinge first before anything else. Okay. Love it, man. What are, what are some other ways that people can test themselves or test their athletes? Uh, I have a, a number of exercises that, that I use. I, I like the strongman movement because they're very low skill. So that allows me to put most people through it without having to, like, you know, how long it takes to, to teach a snatch to someone, right? 
Mm -hmm. uh, strongman movements are very low skill, very easy. So I like to, uh, whenever I have athletes, and that's something they can test on their own, I like to make them do rope pull. Like, so we attach like a 100 feet rope, 125 mm -hmm. feet rope to a sled. We drag it in a parking lot, come back, and we start pulling. I like that exercise because if one arm is weaker than the other, you'll start seeing right away that the athlete is reaching with one arm and not with the other. The, the athlete is right. pulling its okay. elbow back well, but not the other. So that would tell me right away if, if one side has an issue versus the other. And then uh, something like the overhead yoke carry, which is a big, big favorite movement of mine, where they just have to, um, to pick up a yoke, put it overhead and walk with it. And then you'll see right away if one shoulder collapses or not. Mm -hmm. So I like those types of movement because they're very simple. Like whenever I choose a movement, usually I obey three rules. The first rule is he has to show the problem, right, to, uh, to everybody. The second rule is he has to fix the problem at the same time. And the third rule is he has to um, give immediate feedback to the athletes. Because it's one thing to tell an athlete that there is a problem. It's another when the athlete figures out the problem right away on its own. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. works way better. Like telling people... Uh, that something is wrong does not work. No, I mean, they have to feel that there's a problem. So right. th those are always my three rules when I choose an exercise. Yeah, you, you, if you're off on an overhead yoke carry, you're just going to drop it on your head. So you have to fix it immediately. Yeah, or like, you know, like, so uh, I, I leave the yoke about when they are arm extended about like, I don't know, like, you know, six to eight inches off the ground. If you're uneven, mm -hmm. one side will touch. And uh, a lot of time, you'll see that the yoke actually, when, when the shoulder is bad, will face at like 45 degree angle. Mm -hmm. Or like they, uh, they'll feel like they're walking sideways, you know, like they're taking more step toward the left than toward the right. But they'll see themselves that they are not even. Mm -hmm. And so that's very important that, that the athletes has an immediate feedback from an exercise. And so it's the same thing with the, with the, um, the sandbag carries. The, I, I love that exercise. It's very low skill. Just pick up a sandbag and start walking with it. And you'll right. see a lot of people that cannot uh, have like a, like a triple extension, if you want, where everything is lined up. They need to lean forward because their glutes cannot take the pressure. So as second as they get tired, they want to round their back and go forward. And I tell them to stand mm -hmm. tall, just everything aligned. And they have a very, very hard time doing that. And so right away, it'll show you a problem with your glutes. Then after that, there's all the work with the prowler outside, like the sled. Uh, I've noticed that crossfitters have a hard time keeping a good pace on the prowler sprints. Like if I, I'll make them go like about like 120 feet in 12 seconds, I'll give them like 30 seconds, 40 seconds rest. And then I'll do three, four sets. And by the four sets, instead of a 12 second sprint, it turns into a 15 second sprint. Like their mm -hmm. glutes cannot take that kind of abuse because a sprint is a hinge. Right, and they're not good at hinging, so they they uh, they crumble right away. They should be able to do eight sets of sprint like that, no problem. By the fourth or fifth, they all fall apart because the parallel sprints is a hinge, and that's a, mm -hmm. that, that is honestly for all crossfitters out there, fix the hinge. It is a humongous problem, and although the shoulder now is the thing I see the most, I think the 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 lack of hinging will create probably a bigger issue because that's directly to the spine. Wow. I will. Yeah. I'm, my mind is going a million miles a minute just thinking about, you know, the way we train our athletes and, and is there anything that we can change to start to fix this problem? Because I, I agree. It's uh, you see it more often yeah. than not. Yeah. These issues. And again, the sp you, you will be very surprised with the with that exercise with the sprints. So I do it usually mm -hmm. on the minute. It's easy. So doesn't the distance, I like to go back 120 feet, let's say whatever, it's 10 feet per second. So change the weight to make sure that at their max speed, they go right around the 12 second mark for 120 feet, right? Okay. And then on the minute, you make them come back and you go like this. You will see that most crossfitters cannot make it to the fifth sprint under 14, 15 seconds. Mm -hmm. That's very surprising to me because I've done it and I can get to eight to 10 sprints, no problem. And most of my power athletes can do that. It's a humongous problem for CrossFitters. They don't have the glutes to, uh, to be able to do this. And for a sport that has such a high volume of posterior chain, mm -hmm. it's very, very necessary. And CrossFitters cannot do it. Try it on your athletes. You'll be surprised at the results. Wow. And what do you... What, so is that the posterior chains in CrossFitters are just not uh, efficient enough and not yeah. aerobically trained enough? Uh, first of all, it's an energy system that they don't have anymore because CrossFit, when we, when we all started, when we all did it, it was a lot of anaerobic threshold. I remember Fran mm -hmm. and all that. 
you pushed as hard as you could and then you died in the last 10 seconds. But mm. now that it's a sport and strategy has a part in it, like crossfitters are very, very good at strategizing, but they're not very good at pushing anymore as hard. I mean, like they push over volume and over like days and days and days. But on, a, on one workout on short sprints, that aerobic threshold is not being uh, trained anymore. Like a good example was the, the last workout of the Open last year, you know, the row and thrusters. Mm-hmm. That would be an aerobic threshold where you just push right. like crazy and never stop moving. Very simple. Yeah. Very simple. But I would like to see that for like two minute workouts. Mm-hmm. And you'd be surprised like a lot of people cannot bring the intensity high enough anymore because most workouts in CrossFit now are 20 minutes. I mean, that 12 minute range. I mean, 12 to mm-hmm. 20. And so they, they like that. Uh, um, now that I think they stopped training that capacity to go to an anaerobic threshold, which was those excessively intense excessively hard and short workouts and so right that capacity to sprint has, take, has taken a beating and then after that too it's just um, they're not capable of of uh, that much hinging for that long so sprint you'll mm-hmm. see that most athletes will have one foot that that turns in right so that's the mm-hmm. weak side and they're turning their ankle in sorry their foot in because they're trying to press they're not trying to hinge they're trying to squat you know they're trying to push their foot into the ground because they cannot take the hinge anymore. The glute is short. Mm-hmm. So they're trying to turn their foot so they can push off the foot instead of hinging anymore. Right. So I see that with most of them. By the fourth set, they're done. And so their glutes don't fire anymore. And now, of course, if you go toward your quads, you're going to sprint very slowly. And so they all end up in a 15-second run. And then usually that's when I make them stop. And then they start cramping anyway. So. And then you go back to the drawing board, train it more get them more efficient at it and then we do it again yep. there is an energy are, system there that needs to be trained anyway like that mm-hmm. anaerobic threshold and the capacity uh, for sprints and everything this needs to be trained in crossfit without a doubt without a doubt and that's the it's just the most painful oh, yeah. uh, place to be oh, yeah. two minute range oh. there, that 800 meter run is exactly. just, oh. just and nasty that's what i do with the prowler that's what i with all that stuff like right. It's about um, when I do the harness, so we put as much weight as we can, and then and I'll have the the athlete do like a bear crawl with weight mm-hmm. attached, and then they have to drag it and everything. That will take you yep. to go 125 feet. That'll take you close to a minute, and mm-hmm. it's the most painful thing you've ever done in your life. That's when they all crumble, and I take the picture of me smiling on top of them, oh, where everybody thinks I'm an it. asshole. Yeah, that one. <laughs> That's great. So okay. Let, let me dissect this a little bit. Yeah. So if you if we want to get back to training the anaerobic system, mm-hmm. the threshold a little bit more, yeah. about two minute range, we're picking simple movements. What else? So low what skill. Else are the rules. Low skill, low eccentric. Okay, got it. So we're 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 pushing or that for so low eccentric guys means if you're so the eccentric portion on a squat is if you're going down so we just want to be pushing off of stuff exactly and so most of the energy like when you do a movement 60 percent of your energy goes toward the eccentric and only 40 Mm percent toward the concentric although there's some percentage that goes toward the isometric which is stabilization but for the sake of argument it's about 60 40 so i want to do a movement where there's very very low eccentric that way you keep most of your energy for the concentric part where your muscle is flexing so that in the mm-hmm. case of the bear crawl is pushing off your legs so you're going to keep most of your energy into pushing that, ga- that goddamn prowler forward and so you're going to reach a level of contraction in your quads that you're uh, in your quads in your legs glutes mm-hmm. hammies quads that you never reach before because you don't have to spend any, ener- any any energy on the eccentric or on the skill so it's going to be you the weight and whether you're going to bitch out or not Right. Oh man, I fucking love it. What, so what is a, what is one training session of this look like? You're, you're going for two minutes and you're resting. Not quite, not quite. Triple that or what? No, I go, um, I don't go quite in the two minutes. I'm most for, for, uh, my, mine go from 30 seconds to 75, 90 seconds usually because okay. of the, honestly, because of the length of my parking lot. If I had a 200 feet parking right. lot, I go further. <laughs> got it. Got it. But so, um, let's say it's a minute long. If you push hard enough on a, let's say like on a, on a harness, cause I'll, first of all, I'll make you drag the prowler. So we'll have like a handles and a chain and you'll walk mm-hmm. backwards, fully extended again, like triple extension to make sure everything is lined up. And I'll make you mm-hmm. drag the prowler with as much weight as I can for like 125 feet and then take two minute break and do it again. We do three, four sets. So now I took your quads away because you just done a million leg extension with a lot of weight. 
you yep. know, your quads is short. So now I'm going to put you on the harness and the prowler. So now, since you don't have the quads anymore, you're going to have to use your glutes. Wow. And so now I'll make you do the harness with as much plate as I can on the prowler. And then I'll hit you on the back with my stick to make you go 125 feet. It'll take you a minute. And many times people are done. That's it. End of the workout. Wow. Because they'll turn gray. It's a fascinating thing. Uh, you'll see people, their forehead turns gray. That's when I know it's time to stop because they're going to pass out and puke everywhere. But literally, their forehead will turn gray. Like, you know, like they're dead. Mm -hmm. And so uh, <laughs> if the first set doesn't do it, then the second set will. Trust me. <laughs> yep. And so I give them as long as they need to to recover so they can give me a good effort on the next one. So if I need to give an athlete seven minutes for the next one, I will. I don't care about that. What I want is I want maximum effort. Because remember, mm -hmm. that's the point. It's not so much, it's not the conditioning part, even though there is parts of that. It's that they give me maximum effort. So they rest yep. as long as they have to. But then you go back out there and you're going to give me 100%. And again, low eccentric, low skill means you're going to give me everything you got because you will not be limited by the skill of the exercise. So you'll be able to complete every rep and you will not lose your energy on the eccentric part. So it'll mm -hmm. be just flexing. So again, if you want to go 120 feet, uh, we'll choose a way correctly, you can. If you stop, it's because you stop mentally. Right. So there is that whole idea also about intensity that I love so much where I'm like, you, you want to be good? Okay, then show it. I mean, bring yeah. the intensity. The line is over there. Take that weight. Go over there with it. If you stop anywhere in the middle, it's because you're bitching out. You're, wanting, you're mm -hmm. wanting to stop. You're pushing out. Go over there. Finish. Like, you want to be good? Okay, take this. Go over there. It's up to you. Not up to me. It's you. There's enough weight. There's, I didn't put too much weight on the prowler. It is up to you whether you make it or not. And so I'm like, right. then it's you, not me. Now, I mean, so it's not the snatch where you lose it. You go like, oh, I just lost it. What are you going to yeah. lose on the prowler? You're going forward. There's no skill. Come on. And so uh, I'll, I'll push the intensity as far as I can. And the reason I do it on those six sides and not others is because of the low eccentric low skill and it's not, there's no weight, there's, it's not weight bearing. It, that mm. means the soft tissue cannot be damaged. That means you're going to wake up the next morning, you'll be tired, but you won't be hurt. Nothing in your body will hurt. So that means you'll wake up the next morning going, huh, I could have pushed harder. <laughs> yes. You know I mean, so the next time you come to me, you're going to go, yeah, I was a bitch last time. I could have done better. I'm like, okay, let's do it again. So now I'll put same weight, but now you're going to do it faster. Or this time you're not going to stop. Mm -hmm. And then over six months, I will destroy your mind, but you'll become stronger. But the key with this is to bring the intensity uh, without the soft tissue damage. So that means no weight bearing, low eccentric, low skill. Mm -hmm. That means, again, the only thing that is going to stop is you, is your mind. Right. So if you're, you know, to contrast that, you can't just do something super short that has muscle ups and, you know, barbell snatches in it when exactly by the time you get tired, you, you're just standing, staring at the bar. Right? Exactly. Right. And so everything and on top of it, like once you start um, doing muscle ups when you're tired, you're going to wake up the next day and your shoulders, elbows are going to hurt. Right. Right. And so that's the problem is that people make uh, don't understand the difference between pain and intensity. Right. So we don't have pain receptors. We only have intensity receptors in the body. And it's the brain that decides whether to interpret that signal as good or bad. If the, the interpretation is bad because there's a risk of damage on your body, then the brain mm -hmm. will signal pain. And so that means the, brain, uh, the, the pain is only an interpretation of a signal, right? So if you go toward an intensity and every single time you go into intensity, you wake up the next morning with soft tissue damage, the brain will figure it out. And then suddenly the brain will tell you, okay, this is pain, this is bad for us, and it'll find a way to make you stop. So my goal is to bring the intensity up, but without damage. So that way, every time you wake up the next morning, there is no reason for you not to go further, right? Mm -hmm. So do not give yourself reason not to go further into intensity. And every time you create soft tissue damage, any kind of damage to your body is a reason for your brain to signal pain to stop you from doing it. So you are defeating yourself when you push into workouts that can damage you. That's why I, I talk always about uh, low skill, low eccentric, and uh, very low weight bearing exercises because I do not want damage on the body because the damage will set you back mentally every time. So being tough and keeping going through those workouts where you hurt is the dumbest thing you can do because you are setting yourself back every single time. 
your brain will win that battle every time. So the key is push the intensity in a way that will not damage your body. That way you wake up the next morning, you are not in pain and your brain will be like, okay, this was good. Let's go further. So the right. only way to bring more intensity is by being smart about it. I think, um, I, I totally agree. And I think different people need different things. Everyone needs this, this, this threshold training and some people they also need the long training as well oh, no, of course. Or three hour mental grinder of course um, no question you know it, it, it's two very very different stimuli but it, it's way more common for people to go out on these long rucks and hikes and stuff like that but to get back to this kind of training that's this more acute pain um is not is not as common it's just way it just hurts way more this, no, but all this is necessary. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying people should do only that. But it just, it happens that uh, my specialty is to fix people. And mm -hmm. I mostly have strength athletes, uh, CrossFit being part of them. And I need to, uh, they're going to compete. And they're going to compete with, uh, in short workout, that require a certain level of intensity. If you're going to do that kind of effort, you need to train for it. In order to perform at your best, it has to be mm -hmm. trained. You know what I mean? Right. And so me, I, I have a very specific niche of people that come to me. I don't, I don't know that I would necessarily train a triathlete uh, as often into that kind of energy system that a CrossFitter is. I obviously would not. But it, uh, pushing the intensity is not just for, for training. Pushing that intensity is also to teach you something about life. Life is about mm -hmm. pain. We go through pain all the time. It's very important to understand the concept of pain because you, this is something that will follow you in life on everything. You have to understand the difference between intensity and pain, right? If you could remove, um, like, you know, pleasure and pain are very closely related because everything is based on intensity. If you could truly know the difference on, uh, between intensity of pain. There is so much in your life in general, not just training, that could change. And I mean, it is such a, an important life lesson. I've traveled a lot and every uncomfortable situation is, you, you feel it as painful. But if you can train your body and your mind into that intensity zone all the time and realizing there is no damage, it frees your mind for so much stuff outside of training. Suddenly, you can put yourself mm -hmm. into uncomfortable situation in every part of life and not fear that. You'll be able to handle right. discomfort going like, this is just intensity. Okay, you'll have panic attacks and you realize this is just intensity. This is not painful. There is no damage. This is just not, intensity. Not gonna it's not going to kill me. It's not going to damage right. me. This is only intensity. So my thing with this too is to strengthen the human mind by doing this to show them that intensity is not pain. So whenever you, you feel those, those, those things, all you have to do is to control the intensity. Don't try to block out the pain. You cannot. But if you can control intensity, then there is so much more you can do in life. God damn, I love that. My heart's beating faster. <laughs> I love that so much. That's great. Okay, I got a few more, uh, a little more personal questions, and then we'll wrap it up. Yep. Um, who have been some of your biggest influences as a coach? Uh, my biggest influence in life has been my brother. He was, um, I, talk, I talk about him more now, but um, he was my, uh, in a way he raised me and he was by far my biggest influence in my life. He was, uh, he was a smart one. He was the, the smartest, sharpest intelligence I've ever met. He was 18 years older than me and he died about 20 years ago now. And um, I still miss him every week. And uh, mm -hmm. even though it's been 20 years, I had changed nothing for me. He was the, the biggest influence in my life. And he was someone who was very much into philosophy and literature. And he's the one really who taught me how to read. And so he taught me about life, about human beings, about everything. And so he's by far, he's been my influence because I look at everything, not so much from a coaching perspective. I just, when I see someone, I see an athlete, I see a human being. And the only way I look at it is what can I do to better that person? And mm -hmm. if it's to teach them that not to fear pain, if that can make them better as a human being, then that's great. I mean, but... That, that's been mostly, the, my biggest influences have been not necessarily coaches in the strength world. It's been people like Albert Einstein or Sir, Sir Isaac Newton from, for the, not so much for what they, obviously they gave so much to humanity, but for their way of thinking when it came to very complicated problems and how they, they found solutions that were so simple, even though the, like Albert Einstein, people don't remember, but when, when he came up with his theory of space-time, he was seen as a complete crazy guy because at the time, 
There was no such thing as space-time. So he changed our view of the universe just by himself. And he did it really with simple ideas as a guy in an elevator falling or... You know, the guy, what happens, how come when a guy is in a train and juggles, the balls don't, don't, don't fall uh, backwards? So it was very simple ideas that created a complete shift in his way of looking at the universe. And same thing with Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton created calculus in three months over a summer because a guy dared him to. He was like, okay, so prove, prove that you're right. Came back two months later, he had invented calculus. It's, it's uh, the power of the human mind in people like that inspires me in life tremendously. So whenever I get stuck on something, I realize I'm really, really not smart and then I should do a lot better. <laughs> right. And I so it, th those have been my, by far my, uh, but that's again, it's my brother who taught me all this and mm -hmm. looking at the greatness of the human mind. That's, that's really what pushes me in the morning going like, dude, you need to do more. Mm -hmm. So I'm not and that it, smart, but I, I'm trying. Right. And, and all of the, yeah, those two people that you're talking about, three people that you're talking about all taught you principles, yes. not methods. Right? Exactly. It was all and about that because I'm not, it's like I talk about quantum physics all the time. I'm not good enough mm -hmm. to understand, enfin, nobody understands quantum physics anyway, but <laughs> yeah. there, there, there's a very interesting uh, things happening right now in the world of quantum physics because we've been stuck between uh, the, uh, gravity and quantum physics. Like they both work, but if you put them together, they don't anymore. And so hmm. they knew that the way we look at the universe is wrong. There are certain things we don't understand yet. But again, it was, it was very simple ideas uh, that, that changed the way we look at the universe. Too. It always comes down to very simple questions. So that's what I try to do for me in my life, is ask myself the, the simplest question possible in order to change the way I look at things. So yeah, principles, not methods. Ideas. Now, I mean, that's what changes the way you look at the at the at the world is you have to you have to you have to change your perception first mm -hmm. what has been the most recent aha moment for you as a coach and it might have been you know 10 plus years ago but something a time where something really changed for you or something really clicked um like um there was um Something clicked, I guess. I was in Brazil, so it was in 2005. And then I met a Cuban guy over there. I was at Baja Gracie doing jiu-jitsu and everything. And there was a Cuban coach who was the strength and conditioning coach over there. And um, he had, like every Monday morning, he made us do a session on the beach, which was actually very close to CrossFit. But we do it with a partner where we would like squat him on the shoulders and stuff like that. And so you do like 9 to 12 exercises, 10 to 15 rep range, uh, three rounds, right? So it took us about 40 minutes and it was horrible. It was probably the hardest thing I've ever done, especially at the time. And, um, but it was such basic movements. You know I mean? Like squat the guy, uh, you have mm -hmm. to suplex the guy, stuff like that. Like you have to sprint in the, in the same uh, farmer's carry, I mean, um, bright carries, stuff like that. So very simple movement. That got me in the best shape I've ever been in. You know I mean? And there was no, it wasn't, um, what, what struck me at the time was, uh, it, it was so simple in the sense like there was no like, you know, 85%. It was not a bar with exactly mm -hmm. two 15.5 pounds on it. It wasn't 36 seconds with 20 second rest. It wasn't that complicated. You know what I mean? It was very basic movement done on high intensity and that got me the best results ever. And so uh, it really showed me that it's not what you do, it's how you do it. Mm -hmm. And so wow. that, that, that's when really I started to focus more on principles going like, it does not have to be complicated all the time. Sometimes we get stuck into that mindset that we have to make those very intricate programs and stuff like that, where at the end, all you got to do is push the athletes, man. Right. Do it, push the athletes, do it smartly, find good ways to do it so they don't get hurt and just push. So that's why the prowler really came about and all that stuff. I was like, I'm going to find a way to push the athletes as far as I can without hurting them. That's it. That really, it's, I was like, okay, so how do I do that? And then from there, I started to build the system. But the idea was just, if you can bring the intensity high enough, you will elicit a response from the body. And the, it was, um, after that, it's what uh, Abhi Jaif, uh, the coach Abhi Jaif was saying, said the yeah. greater the stress uh, on the body, the greater the quality of the protein produced. So that really, that meant the greater um, the greater the stress, the better quality of muscle you would produce. That was right. his whole idea. And that's why he stressed the shit of his athletes. 
because he figured like by uh, get, creating a greater stress, he would create a better answer. My only problem with this system is that he used Olympic weightlifting, which is very stressing on the soft tissue. So he killed mm -hmm. an entire generation of athletes. But the idea is still valid. So me, I was like, okay, so how do I create a greater stress, but without damaging soft tissue? And then my entire system was based from there. Mm -hmm. Wow. What is, what, what is something that you believe as a coach uh, or just as a person that most others or all other people around you think is crazy? Uh, in CrossFit, uh, it was the assistance work. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, well, I mean, most coaches are there. So I was talking about the box, right? So imagine inside that box, I was talking in the, in the shaft. Inside that box is the, the fuel to make the box go higher. I call that the circle that fits inside the box. It's hormesis, which is uh, so favorable response to stress. Most coaches out there are circles. They, 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 they only seem to care about the amount of stress that they put on the, on the athlete to elicit a response. So mm -hmm. that's so cool. Me, I'm a square. I'm the guy who balances the athletes. But the thing is, in order to, to put more stress into that box, first you need to make the box bigger. So I seem to care, to care a lot more about balancing the athletes and making, them, um, making that box bigger than I am about stressing them necessarily. So I pay more attention to small details than most out there. Like when I see a faulty pattern, I will, st I will fix that first. Whereas most coaches are circles, they're mostly concerned about stress, about creating stress. Now, I mean, so it's a very, to me, it's a short term mentality. But like, yeah, but there's a competition going, you need to push. You need to do this, you need to do that. Where me, I'm always taking a step back going like, no, I don't like the way this is. We're going to fix that movement first. We're going to make sure this doesn't hurt. So I have a different way of looking at it because I'm, I'm a square. I mean, I'm a box. Mm -hmm. Most coaches out there are circles. Right. I love it, man. This is good shit. Um, where can people find out more about you, um, get in touch with you? And what should they know about like what's uh, what's coming up for you? So uh, I have a website which is uh, strongfit.com where they can they can see a lot of the stuff out there. I got the blog on there. Uh, I have a YouTube channel which is a strongfit, and on Instagram at strongfit one. And um, mm -hmm. I have a two day a week template that I'm going to put out very soon to help with uh, CrossFitters uh, and everything to uh, to incorporate some of the movement I talk about all the time. And then I'm going to do a set of seminars in Europe this summer. And I'm going to try to go after that to Australia, Latin America and different places. So I'm going to try to, um, what I would like to do is to create a field for the movement specialists out there that are trying to do uh, what I do, but don't have necessarily a structure to do it. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to try to make this bigger. That's phenomenal, man. I mean, your philosophy on life uh, and coaching really hit home for me so that's I'm, awesome i'm looking forward to learning more from you cool that's awesome. i appreciate appreciate you making the time to do this my pleasure uh guys you can find me at michael Cashew. that's c-a-z-a-y-o-u-x on instagram twitter etc um and then if you're not already subscribed to our newsletter go to brute strength training.com sign up for that we'll let you know about all the new podcasts resources programs coming out etc Thanks again, man. We'll talk soon. My pleasure. Talk to you soon.